والله يدعو الى دار السلام ويهدي من يشاء الى صراط مستقيم قال الذين ينفقون اموالهم في سبيل الله كمثل حبه انبتت سبع سنابل وكل في فلك يسبحون ويخلق ما لا تعلمون السلام عليكم ورحمة الله Peace and Allah's mercy be upon you Alhamdulillah, all praise belongs to Allah alone Wa salatu wa salam ala rasulillah we ask for his blessing and peace upon his messenger and prophet Muhammad and welcome to Universal Quran. The Quran is Allah's revelation to all of humanity. The purpose of carrying this message to everyone is that each human being has a right to know how to live in a way that is pleasing to his or her creator. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created each human being on a fitrah, or on an inner Islamic nature, so that each person was born as a Muslim, and it is part of their heritage and right to know the revelation of Allah. And therefore, it is our duty as Muslims to teach people about Islam and explain to them the message. Anyone who chooses to reject the message of the Qur'an, to reject Islam, they have the right to do so, and the consequences uh, uh, must be made known to them, so that they can make that decision knowing the consequences from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And anyone who chooses to obey and submit themselves humbly to Allah, uh, join us within the religion of Islam and become our brothers and sisters in faith. This is why we call it the universal Qur'an, because the Islamic brotherhood encompasses people of every nationality and every race throughout the world, because all of us were created on the original Islamic nature. And that nature, if we will listen to it, is calling us back to Allah, calling us to the path which leads to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The person who will listen to his or her conscience or that inner voice within them, which was created in them by their Lord, when they approach the Qur'an with an open mind, asking Allah for guidance, uh, they will see and understand clearly from the, their recitation of the Qur'an and their understanding of its interpretation an explanation that it is truly Allah's word and therefore they should believe in it and submit to it. We're currently reading from chapter 75, Al-Qiyamah, which is part of the 29th section of the Qur'an. The Qur'an has 30 sections, so it's the next to last section. And this section was revealed in Mecca. One of the earliest, some of the earliest surahs or chapters revealed come in this section. And it emphasizes the two important fundamentals of the Islamic faith, belief in the oneness of Allah, that He alone has all the power to create and to sustain this universe. He alone deserves our worship and praise and to believe in life after death, that we will be held accountable on the day of judgment for our actions here on the earth. And that is the focus of this chapter, which is called Al-Qiyamah or the Resurrection. In our last show, we were discussing uh, verses, uh, uh, verse 29 and verse 30 of this chapter, and we did not have the time to complete our discussion of that chapter. And so I'm going to go on and finish that. Uh, then in, in a while, we'll, we'll complete the rest of, of, of this chapter, inshallah, God willing, in this program. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was saying to those people who believe that they can delay their repentance, that that is not possible, but once the angel of death comes to you on your deathbed to take your soul, then it's too late for you then to change your mind and say, oh, I'm sorry, I rejected Allah, I'm sorry, I've committed sins, and I now repent and go back to Allah. Then it's too late because you can see the reality in front of your faces, and so it's not a good deed. When I see this table and I say that's a table, that's not that's of no significance because it's obvious to anybody that this is a table. And so once I see the table, it's... It's no longer a significant thing. I can see it with my eyes. So once I see the reality of the angels of death and resurrection, then it's not significant to iman or to faith that I believe in it. 
but I have to believe in it because of Allah's proofs and evidence in His revelation to me, even though it's ghayb, it's unseen before my eyes. So Allah gives us examples of the difficulty and trial at the time of death, that you start having the difficulty of breathing and it gets harder and harder and a certain sound comes out of your throat as the spirit is being taken by the angels. It's like a strangulation or a feeling of, 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 of not being able to any longer breathe because, of course, the breath is leaving your body. The spirit of the believer will be taken out, though, very gently by the angels and will be respected and treated with noble treatment and generous treatment. But those who have rejected Allah SWT will be taken out with force and difficulty. They will fight death and resist it to the last and their spirit will not willingly leave, but it will be taken out by force. Allah gives an example of that difficult time when He says, that it's a time of difficulty, anxiety, and distress. And whenever this term is used in Arabic, it indicates such a difficulty and a great trial and trouble in Islam. That the legs will be joined to the other. That the legs are paralyzed and are no longer useful to you in this world, but you can no longer function. Your legs don't work for you anymore and the other par parts of your body don't work for anymore as slowly your, your ability and control over your body leaves until it leaves completely. And then, of course, when you're dead, you're enshrouded, your legs are put together and cloth is wrapped upon it to prepare you for your burial. And so literally one leg is joined to the other and they're tied together. And that is, of course, the sunnah of Islam, the way the Prophet Muhammad wasallam told us and the previous prophets also to enshroud the body and uh, not to, as for example, is done today in, in the West, you put makeup on the body, embalm it, and bury it in a tuxedo or in its best dresses, and they put jewelry on the body and all kinds of valuable things, and bury it in an in extremely expensive coffin of silk and the most valuable woods and metals, gold and silver, and a huge amount of money is wasted being buried in the ground. But the actual way of burying the body is to wash it and anoint it as you wash the body and make the wudu and ghusl in this life. It's washed and anointed, it's kept shrouded and, and perfumed with perfumes and incense and it's buried in the ground without wasting expensive, valuable property of, of coffins and those kind of things that people do in the West. So this time, the most difficult time, is when, to the perspective of the dead person, heaven becomes sort of joined with earth. That now you're still here in this earth, but now you see, see the reality of the, of the other life. It's like the veil is suddenly lifted from your eyes and you understand that, you're, that there is another world beyond this. And that is the time when it's too late then for repentance, too late to go back. As Allah says in verse 30, on that day you will be driven to your Lord. That's the only way is that they will be taken on that day to their Lord, meaning at the time of death. The angels will take the spirit up to the heavens and Allah will say that, I created this man from dust and he has to go back to the dust. And so the angels will take him back down in a very gentle way with the believer whose spirit will be enjoying the vision of paradise or with the unbeliever, the heavens will reject him in a very harsh way and he will be tormented with a vision of his place in hellfire while he is in the tomb. Even believers who have committed certain sins, major sins and have not repented to Allah Taala, they may be tormented in their tomb also as a way of purifying their soul and preparing it for paradise or they may on the day of judgment actually be sent to hell as a reality and be released from hell by the intercession of the Prophet Sallallahu and the believers after they have spent a certain amount of peri a certain period of time being punished in hellfire for their sins which are major sins which they did not repent from. So all of us have to look at this, the time of death. Even if we are Muslims, even if we pray and we fast and do good deeds, we still have to make sure that we ask Allah for forgiveness for any sins, minor or major, before the day, time of death comes because none of us know when that time is. Let's read now verses 31 through 40, please. فَلَا صَدَّقَ وَلَا صَلَّى ولكن كذب وتولى ثم ذهب إلى أهله يتمطى أولى لك فأولى ثم أولى لك فأولى 
أيحسب الإنسان أن يترك سدى ألم يكن طفة من مني يمنى ثم كان علقة فخلق فسوى فجعل منه الزوجين الذكر والأنثى أليس ذلك بقادر على أن يحيي الموتى So the disbeliever neither believed nor prayed. But on the contrary, he belied and turned away. Then he walked in full pride to his family, admiring himself. Woe to you! Then again, woe to you! Again, woe to you! And then again, woe to you! Does man think that he will be left neglected without being punished or rewarded? Was he not a sperm drop poured forth? Then he became a clot? Then Allah shaped and fashioned him in due proportion and made him in two sexes, male and female. Is not Allah able to give life to the dead? Thank you. So Allah SWT is saying to that person who has delayed his repentance until it's too late, until the time of his death, this person is going to be punished by Allah SWT because when he had a life and he had a choice, he chose not to pray. When the call to prayer is made, the muadhin, the caller to the prayer, invites people, come to the prayer, come to falah, to su success in this life and the hereafter. Success in this life by following Allah's wise guidance, which will lead you to all that is good in this world and to avoid all that is evil and harmful in this world. And success in the hereafter, which is salvation from hellfire and entrance into paradise. But he did not. He did not believe. He did not believe in the Qur'an, he did not believe in the message of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, but he rejected, rejected it and he refused to join the people in prayer, humbly submitting to Allah, their creator. As in verse 32, on the contrary, he did not do that, but he did the opposite. The opposite of being invited to salat is then, and approaching the salat is to belie and turn away to deny and reject and turn away from the Salat. That is the opposite of believing in the Qur'an and accepting the message of the Prophet Muhammad wasallam. So he denied and turned his back on his commandments, the commandments of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then, verse 33, Then he walked to his family full of pride and conceit, admiring himself, being conceited, and feeling proud and vain and also lazy that I don't have to submit myself to Allah SWT. I can be totally free and independent to do whatever I want and to not do the things I don't want to do. So I don't have to pray. I don't have to fast. I don't have to give charity. I don't have to help other people. I can lie. I can cheat. I can steal, murder, whatever I want because I'm totally free and independent. And of course this is what Allah is rejecting because none of us are independent but Allah created us from the weakest substances and everything we have, every power, every benefit we have in this life is purely a grace from Allah, a gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to the human being on this world. None of us created himself and so it's a false pride and vanity because a true pride is when you have actually done something and you are proud of, and glad of your accomplishment that you did something. But to be proud of something that you had no control over is foolishness. That I'm proud that Allah has made me intelligent and, and strong and given me my, my appearance and I'm proud of all these things which were not of my control. So how can I be proud that I had good ancestors when I, had, I couldn't choose my own parents or I'm proud of my race even though I couldn't choose my, my race that I was born in or the nation in which I was born. So all that is false pride and vanity which leads us to reject Allah's message to reject the prophets and reject the message of the Qur'an. So it's what leads us astray to not pray and humbly submit ourselves. And so that's the kind of pride that is the opposite of humility, which is realizing your weaknesses and realizing that your Creator has given you great blessings and you need to be thankful for that. That's all we have time for before the break. We'll come back and we'll finish the rest of this chapter, inshallah, God willing. 
The Quran, the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the miraculous words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah the Most High spoke the Quran. It's the thing between us and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Are we given the rights of the Quran? Are you ready to stand in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the day of judgment? For the Quran to take us from our hands to the Jannah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Do we go through every verse in the Quran to get to know what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants from us? Watch Huda TV, Quran in depth. Welcome back to Universal Quran. We're studying from Chapter 71, Al Qiyamah. Before the break, we're reading the verses talking about that person who has rejected the Quran, refused to humbly submit himself before Allah in prayer, responding to the call of the prophets and messengers and the scriptures, and understand the understanding of the reality of this universe, and instead has become falsely vain and arrogant and falsely proud, as if he had created himself, as if he had uh, created his provision, his rizq, which he has in this world, while in fact it's all the creation of Allah alone. Uh, in verse 34, Allah warns him, Woe to you, uh, destruction upon you, a great calamity will befall you who have rejected. How dare you walk? so proudly and vainly before your Creator when you are responsible for nothing of your creation, nor can you sustain yourself in this universe without the creation of Allah alone. Uh, Allah is going to put you to a severe test and torment. And so this is the reason that person has no hope when the angel of death appears before him at the time when he is on his deathbed. In verse 36, does the human being does this person who is arrogant, does he think that he will be neglected and left without being punished or rewarded? This is a false concept of religion that some people who claim they believe in God say that I believe in God, but I don't believe that Allah would punish anybody in hellfire. I've actually seen, for example, priests from uh, the Christian church say that they believe in heaven, but they don't believe in hell and they don't believe in a God who would ever punish anybody. And yet Allah created this world and people are suffering in this world every day. And they believe in God, so they must believe that Allah could deliver those people from suffering. He could make this world a Jannah or a paradise where there was no sickness and no death and it would be only happiness. But Allah created this world as a test and a trial for us. If we do right, then we will have a reward in paradise. And that will make, that will make this world significant. That will make, mean that it was worth it to suffer in this world. And if we are evil in this world, Allah will uh, give us a, a, a torment and a punishment hellfire. And that will mean that those who are guilty will not get away without any uh, punishment, without justice being applied upon them. So the only thing that makes this life understandable is that there is a life to come and that there is a reward or punishment. It's the only way that this world would have a meaning to us. Otherwise, it would be just a play and amusement. And that is the worst insult against Allah that you can come up with. That Allah created this world as a sport, as a play and amusement with no meaning and no purpose behind it. That would imply that Allah has no wisdom, no justice, no knowledge, and, or no power. One of those things or all of them combined. The worst insults against Allah. And so it's not possible to believe in the concept of God and not believe that there is going to be a, a reward and punishment for the deeds of the human being here in this earth. But it's an essential part of any logical, reasonable understanding of religion as far as the Quran is concerned, as far as I can understand with my mind. There's no possibility of the one without the other. God without the Day of Judgment. But those are two essential concepts that we have to understand. So the human being will be held responsible and his deeds will be accounted for on the Day of Judgment. Then Allah asks some questions. Not because Allah doesn't know, but to direct us 
to think about these matters. Was the human being, verse 37, was he not a drop of liquid which poured forth from his father, many or, or semen, the liquid which comes from the father's sexual discharge into the, uh, which eventually goes into the uterus of the female? Wasn't every human being created from this insignificant source, from one insignificant sperm which traveled up the, uh, the uh, passage to the womb of the mother and then fertilizes the egg and from which every single human being, every one of us was created from these two small insignificant sources. If the human being was created from such an insignificant thing, their beginning was not something which, uh, if you would look at it, you would say, oh, this promises to be something great in the future. You'd say, this is some insignificant thing, disgusting, get it away, wipe it away, uh, clean it up, it's a mess, get it away from me. So the human being has this lowly beginning, but Allah develops it. Now you can see the stage of the araka when it becomes something that clings, a very small uh, uh, thing clinging to the womb of the mother. As it develops, it gradually develops internally into the first stages of a living being of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and every single creature was created from that. And from them Allah creates male and female. They came from a male and female, but the male and female come together and they produce what? sometimes males and sometimes females. The wisdom behind sexual reproduction is that we get the best strengths and characteristics from each of our parents. So we're not identical clones to one parent as an asexual reproduction, but each one of us gets beneficiary uh, 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 genetic material. So one parent may have a resistance, for example, to certain diseases, and we would get that resistance from that parent. And sometimes uh, one one parent would have a genetic weakness which would cause them to be susceptible to a certain disease. But unless both parents have that same weakness, the child with Allah's will would not get that. So there's a great wisdom in that the higher levels of creatures have sexual reproduction that it causes the species to remain strong and to maintain resistance against diseases and to improve themselves. So we're not all identical, we're all individuals. And so we're individuals who have been given by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala choice to choose good or to choose evil. So the human being, as Allah said, He created them as two sexes, male and female, from that insignificant beginning in verse 40. أَلَّيْسَ ذَلِكَ بِقَادْرٍ Is not that one who, who, who created the human being from such an insignificant drop? Is he not able عَلَىٰ أَنْ يُحْيَى الْمَوْتَىٰ To bring life back to the dead? What is more difficult? To take something which is uh, insignificant and create it and form it into something which is totally different because none of us is an egg, none of us is a sperm, but every one of us is a totally different creature than an egg and a sperm. We've been created from something totally different and Allah through stages has brought us. None of us is a fetus. None of us shares any characteristics with those with that initial stage of human development, but we have advanced to a totally different thing other than that. In fact, scientists say that at certain stages in the womb, uh, the fetus is hardly distinguishable from the fetuses of other creatures. At one stage, it's similar to uh, a fish. At another stage, similar to animals. And then it gets its unique characteristics of the human being. It develops slowly. So is, it's very difficult to imagine that one substance is totally transformed in a totally, to a totally different creature, from very simple to extremely complex creation of Allah. That must be extremely difficult, but for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala it's very easy. But what if you had a human being, but you broke the human being down to his parts, and then you had, of course, the ability which Allah has to put it back together, which is more difficult? To take something out of nothing and make it to something, or to take the parts, and simply recombine the parts. Obviously, yeah, of course. It's more difficult to take something from nothing and make it into a unique being than to take the parts of that being and reassemble it. And so even today with our science and technology, sometimes a person can lose a body part and we can replace it, not with something perfect, but we can make a decent re, you know, replacement for an arm or a hand. And uh, how many times have you heard 
there was a, a person, a, a shark or an alligator, bit off their leg or arm or other body part, and they sewed it back on. So we have the ability, you know, maybe doctors in the past wouldn't have been able to do. But we've been given the ability to learn and develop technology, and now we can put people's parts back together, replace some organs of the body, replace a kidney, replace a, a lung, replace an eye sometimes. It may be possible in the future to do even things that we can't imagine. So how about with the last Matata? He can take even your molecules and atoms that have decomposed and put them back together. And even if, uh, you know, as we know, even if you totally destroy the body, it comes back down to its molecules and atoms. And Allah knows where they are in creation, how to bring them back again. But where did this entire universe come from? People, in the time the Qur'an was revealed, thought the universe was eternal. They thought it had no beginning and no end. But the Qur'an said, no, the universe came. It burst into existence by Allah's word, kun, fayakun, bi, and it came into existence out of nothing. The entire universe, and it will be snuffed out again back to non-existence. There will be nothing left except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and His power. He will bring this creation back again from nothing. So, Allah doesn't need even a molecule or an atom of your creation to bring you back because this entire universe was created from nothing. Today, scientists who believe in nothing, who believe in God or don't believe in it, they all acknowledge that this universe came into existence from, in one single event from nothing into everything that exists. And likewise, it's easy for Allah to bring the entire universe back, including every single being here on this earth. So it's much easier for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bring us back into a second creation than it, w- than it would have been even for the first creation. But for Allah it's equal. But it would seem to our minds that it's easier to bring something back that had, had died than to recreate or to create something from nothing. And yet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has the ability equally to do all of those things to bring us back from combining our parts, bringing our bones back together, putting skin back on the bones, or to simply bring us back with His word, be, and bring us back into existence out of nothing. In Surah Rum, chapter 30 of the Holy Quran, verse 27, it is Allah who originates the creation and then repeats it. So there are cycles within the creation. The original and then the repetition. When the original goes, you can repeat it and copy it. These are some things that we have an understanding today of the physics, of how the universe came into existence that people didn't have when the Qur'an was revealed. But it all comes as a testimony of the original teaching of the Holy Qur'an that the world came out of nothing and it is traveling at a high speed to its end point which is known only to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so they call that the Big Bang Theory, that everything came into existence, that everything was one piece of matter and Allah brought it out that one piece of matter, where did it come from? Nobody knows. It came from nothing. Allah broke it apart in a huge, huge cataclysmic event where the heavens and earth were one rataqa, they were one substance, and Allah tore them apart, and the heavens became separate from the earth, and all the beings came from there. And so Allah is going back to the beginning of this chapter. He is not then the one who did that able to bring back, back the resurrection. There's only one possible answer. Bella, yes, O Allah, you have the power to do so. I submit humbly to you alone, the Lord of the universe. May Allah guide us to the truth of the Holy Quran. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. صُنِعَ اللَّهِ الَّذِي أَتْقَنَ كُلَّ شَيْءٍ إِنَّهُ خَبِيرٌ بِمَا تَفْعَلُونَ مَثَلُ الَّذِينَ يُنْفِقُونَ أَمْوَالَهُمْ فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ كَمَثَلِ حَبَّةٍ أَنْبَتَتْ سَبْعَ سَنَابِلٍ وَكُلٌّ فِي فَلَكٍ 